It's time for the Douglas Coleman Show. Mr. Smooth and Savvy is joined by guests from all walks of life. From the entertainment industry to authors to political and social commentators. The famous and not so famous. The controversial and the light and fluffy. We have it all. Now, here's Douglas Coleman. Well, hello there. Heidi, howdy you there? Welcome to the Douglas Coleman Show. It's me, Douglas Coleman. How are ya? Nice to have you with us. Thank you for joining us. We've got two great interviews today, both people who are well-established in the entertainment industry, both musicians. First one up is Cleve Hattersley, and Cleve is a genuine 60s guy. He uh, tells his story in his new book called Life is a Butt Dial, which pretty much chronicles all the stories that he will tell in the interview, such as dealing weed in the day, getting busted, working in the music industry, and rubbing elbows with just about everybody who was anybody in those days. He tells a good story about James Brown and Bill Graham, Jerry Garcia, just to name a couple. He's in a band called Greasy Wheels, which is an Austin, Texas-based rock alternative Americana band that formed in the 70s. He will be up first, followed by Jeffrey Bryan, Jeffrey is the current keyboard player for the band Survivor. He's been with them for about three years. Uh, he was also an actor at one time. He was in the film Karate Kid and also a film called Hot Moves. He also performed on the Merv Griffin Show at the age of 15. And he was a staff writer for a while at the publishing wing of a and Records. So lots of different things Jeff has done. He will be up in the second half of the show. And if you are a musician and looking for an extra bit of promo for your song, we offer a complete radio promotional package. Your song will play once a week for four weeks. You will also get a 15-minute interview on the show to come and talk about whatever you want. And also a permanent spot on our website, which will feature your photo and links to your music and to your websites. It's a great deal for only $49.99. For more information, please go to our website, douglascolemanshow.com, and click on the Complete Radio Promotional Package link for more details. Without further ado, here is Cleve Hattersley. Okay, please welcome to the Douglas Coleman Show, Cleve Hattersley. Hey, Cleve, how are you? Hey, thanks for having me, Douglas. Uh, Totally honored, you know. Radio always makes you feel cool. (laughs) Thank you for coming on. I appreciate it. Your story is pretty cool. Your, I was reading through your bio, a lot of information there. Why don't you oh, just, way too much, probably. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. But why don't you just start at the beginning? Just tell us your story. Sure. Yeah. Can we start in the sixth grade? <laughs> well, not that far back. You can start... Uh, Actually, I can start in the sixth grade because... All right. Where I'll try to be brief about it, but I was on the sixth grade basketball team, and I was a pretty good player. I always had a Jerry West jump shot, Okay. And But I was a fat kid with long, skinny legs at that time. And I was running towards the basket to do a little lap shot. And the kid hollered out, look at those greasy wheels. And that became my life story. Aha, uh-huh. okay. And I came to Texas um, in 1969. A pot dealer I knew uh, sent me a ticket because I had moved into the, the hate. Uh, with a bunch of New Yorkers who moved in with a bunch of Texans. Uh, And um, it was a very unique meeting of tribes because both groups are used to large things. Uh, So we understood each other, and it was was a perfect combo in that the the, uh, Texans almost never talked, and the New Yorkers never shut up. (laughs) That's about right. It was absolutely perfect. And then, uh, so, when uh, the hate started dying, and it died pretty quickly after that, actually, um, and I had the opportunity to come down and uh, get into a new business of smuggling pot out of Austin. Uh, and um, I did it pretty well a few times. Uh, I would take uh, pretty large amounts up to New York and sell it directly out of the Fillmore East, mm. at which I had worked for uh, Bill Graham. Uh, and they allowed me to sit up on the balcony and deal my wares. <laughs> uh, but then I got popped, and after I got popped, I had to find a new career. 
because I was on appeal and I had an opportunity to try to think of something else to do and I started playing gigs. My first gig was opening for uh, Jimmy Vaughn and Storm. Hmm. Uh, and I and I call it a double bill. Okay, you you got to give me that. <laughs> but it was an opportunity that uh, uh, kind of uh, gave me impetus. A band formed pretty quickly around that, a very family kind of thing with, you know, just some local Austin players that, you know, we all enjoyed smoking a good joint and playing music together. And uh, I think we were together about a few months and we heard about this fiddle player who was playing with a uh, legendary a guy down here named Kenneth Threadgill. He, he he had discovered Janis Joplin. Okay. Okay. And uh, because they used to do jam sessions at his little garage, and Janis was the first for him to discover, and the second was Sweet Mary, who is now my wife. Uh, and um, a week after Mary joined the band, Eddie Wilson, who was the founder of the Armadillo World Headquarters, came to a rehearsal and hired us on the spot to open for the Burrito Brothers. I know this is a little long-winded for radio here, but it's almost fucking over, okay? Okay. Um, we're, and, and so we got, we got it. We were opening for the Burrito Brothers. We were the fourth or the third opener on a four-act bill. So we were the first guys up. And we got an encore. We absolutely couldn't believe our, you know, what kind of luck is this? You know, there's like 800 people out there telling you, do more. And, of course, we thought right then we'd fucking made it. We were, we were you know, top of the mark. And um, you know, 50 years later, we're celebrating our anniversary next year. But it was a good ride. Did a lot of cool stuff. Played a, with a lot of folks. Uh, and uh, it led me into working at places like the Lone Star Cafe in New York, which was legendary in the um, late 70s into the early 90s, actually. We had everybody from uh, George Strait showing up for his first gig to uh, the Blues Brothers and Belushi hanging out there and forming at... Wow. And rehearsing at the star, and then doing running the Blue Note when everybody was still alive. Dizzy Gillespie and uh, some of the boys from the Modern Jazz Quartet, Connie Kay and uh, Mill Jackson, had a running poker game in my office. And it began to occur to me that no matter what I was doing, as long as I went towards the flame, I wasn't getting burnt up like so many others, like Jimmy and Janice and everybody. But I was just getting a little bit of a better tan. And, and it's kind of kept me uh, sort of near the flame and always having these lucky accidents and meeting people and hanging out with people. And uh, working with Kinky Friedman for 40 years has helped as well. Um, you know, um, I'm actually the brains behind the Jew. Uh, I'm, he's my hand puppet. Uh, and we've been doing things as a sort of a partnership, me behind the scenes for all that time. And now... Um, we're actually performing together, not in, on the same stage, but we do a show, he does a show, and we've been taking that tour across the country. And um, we're starting to sound like each other. Um, I'm starting to crack Jew jokes, and uh, he's starting to believe that I'm actually a Jew, which I didn't discover until I was 39 years old. <laughs> First thing Kenki said was, just think, Cleve, if you'd known that when you were 11 years old, you'd be a rich man today. Uh, and he does. He it took him 35 years to actually confirm that he believes I'm a Jew. I did not have to show him that I had been circumcised, uh, but there was always that threat. We discovered a few things about the Kingster on this on this road trip. He and I have a quid pro quo, and we understand quid pro quo, unlike our chieftain. For example, if I go into a store uh, to use the bathroom because we tour, you know, we're driving a lot. I always buy something, usually a bottle of water, so I can pee at the next door. Kinky leaves a horrendous dump in their bathroom. It's, it's his form of quid pro quo, but it is an understanding of quid pro quo. Uh, anyway, so I started telling stories um, on Facebook, which is, God damn it, I'm in the 21st century. I can't believe it. Um, and people started picking up on it, and a guy who has made his fortune... Uh, selling rolling papers and crack pipes, but has founded a um, 501c3 publishing company, uh, has published my book. And um, he gave me carte blanche pretty much on how to put it together, what to put in it. He insisted on photographs, so there's lovely pictures of me. I'm, I think you've gotten a copy of this book, have you, Douglas? Um, no, not yet. 
oh, my God, I'm going to have to send you a copy of the book. Before we leave, let me get your address. Okay. And uh, we'll, we'll sign one personal for you. No, thank you. I appreciate that. Oh, my pleasure. So, so that's where it's been for me. You just At the age of uh, 72, I'm still younger than Kinky, so I still look up to him for wisdom and advice. But at the age of 72, if you still have a memory, um, there are stories to tell. Well, wasn't that the uh, the old line, if you can remember the 60s, you weren't there? <laughs> well, sadly, I was both there and remember. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess some people do find that uh, a little, you know, tough to deal with, you know. Um, it was a extremely exciting time. There was always something fresh going on, you know, whether it was a bee-in or... Uh, flowers being put into cops' badges and things. I mean, it was just happening everywhere. Okay, let me... Uh, or at least we felt it was, yeah. Let me uh, throw in a couple things here. You mentioned two things that I want to touch on. Number one is the hate. Um, what year did you get there? I got there at the end of... At the beginning of 68. I, I missed the summer of love by three months. Okay. But it still hung in the air. And it was still very much um it wasn't overcrowded quite yet but you could see people were flowing in every day uh, there was a gal who sold 25 cent hamburgers to starving hippies on the street so we could go out and sell berkeley barb newspapers for a quarter we'd buy them for 12 cents and sell them for a quarter or we would just panhandle <laughs> um but we it, it was degrading already um we lived right across the street from charles manson wow we lived at 408 Coal Street, and he lived at 407 Coal Street. Did you meet him? I actually saw him on the street quite frequently because he would proselytize actually on a milk crate. He was a very short guy. He would stand on a milk crate right in front of the straight theater, which stood at the corner of Coal and Hate. And I never listened to what the fuck he was saying because I he, he was just, you know... He, it's like these days when you see people walking down the street talking, you wonder, are they talking to themselves or do they have an earpiece? Well, in those days, there were no earpieces, so we thought he was just talking to himself. But we could see into their um, uh, flat across the uh, street, and but we didn't want to. There was something going on. I, I mean, it was very clear, I think, to the clear-minded of us in those days that that was not clear stuff. There was something really going on. And uh, I actually flirted with Linda Kasabian before I knew she'd gone off with that. Ah, yeah, that's a name I remember. Well, now, this was, was yeah, well, a lot of them were. Uh, Leslie Van Houten was, too. You know. Oh, my God, yeah. They would go up and down the street singing songs and stuff. You could see them out there every now and then when they travel in groups. They'd be singing, you know. And, it's, and again, even though that looked all pretty and hippie, to us real hippies, <laughs> it was scary as shit. <laughs> now, this was before the murders, right? Oh, yeah. 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 Yeah, because the murders um, were in 69, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They, they didn't head down to the Spawn Ranch until... I mean, he already knew about it, uh, evidently, but uh, it was just... Uh, uh, you know, and it, of course, on the other end of the spectrum, the Grateful Dead lived right up the street, so we saw them all the time. They would often put a flatbed truck out on the green of the uh, panhandle, which was a part of the park uh, at which our street abutted. Cole Street ran right into the park. And they would put a flatbed out there for music, maybe once a month right there. And uh, the first time I, I ever met Janice was they were the ones that we heard playing outside the window. You could um, have social and sexual, I should say, intercourse with uh, all the people that became sort of the, the leaders of that, uh, if you would call it a movement, but just the most well-known folks. We were all mingling. Uh, let me and, ask uh, you something about the culture and something that's probably, that everyone had probably partaked that you have mentioned. What is your overall opinion of LSD, or the experience of it? I had two kinds of LSD. And the first I had was actually, uh, we got it from um, the League for Spiritual Discovery in New York City, which was the Timothy Leary kind of fronted place. They had a storefront on Perry Street, and 
you could actually get vials of Sandoz acid, okay? That was very interesting. I, I was afraid of it, even when I was enjoying it, because I'm a control freak within, uh, you know, I really am a Jew, uh, a control freak within, uh, and it kind of, you know, it took me to an edge that was interesting but scary. The Owsley acid that I had later sent me to the Hate Street Clinic. I, it was just not the same thing. And they gave me a shot of Thorazine, which was the only way to calm you down. First they said, put me in with a street freak and to, to talk me down. And I said, I just went nuts. Are you kidding me? Um, and uh, But the, the acids were different. And so I, I don't really think it's good for everybody. Some people lived with it. People like Rocky Erickson fell apart from it. I mean, he was already kind of a, you know, a split personality, but the acid, when I met him, he was pretty much insane. You know, uh, um, I don't know if, that, if, if you got, got any of that information in the bio. That uh, I would, I, the, the third time I went, I was back and forth in New York and San Francisco a lot. The third time I went out there was that big Ricky, the guacamole queen, who was kind of a matron of the entire Austin scene, had insisted that I and my best pal Stephen, the bass player, Stephen Hernander, come out and join the 13th floor elevators because Rocky and Tommy Hall were out there in San Francisco and they needed a band. Uh, and Rocky was just uh, too far shot loose to, to even consider it. But I do approve and I do think um, uh, mescaline and psilocybin uh, can be very beneficial. And right now uh, some of the best um, information is coming with the, the use of uh, microdose psilocybin as a, um, it's, a re it's helping people clear their heads when they're having too much stress and so on. Uh, I'm definitely a, a pro pot guy. I ran a couple of kinky statewide campaigns down here for office, and we were always including uh, legalization as part of the, uh, the platform. Well, it's happened. Uh, I mean, it's happened in a handful of states, and uh, yeah, we kind of knew know. it was going to when we first started. When I, my dad turned me on when I was seventeen years old. He was a very hip guy, beat uh, photography guy, and he sent me down to a guy to get smoked pot. And at that time, we would sit around and um, and maybe estimate there were a couple hundred thousand people smoking pot. You know, that was probably a good estimate. Who knew? Uh, and and we but we always knew that this was going to be a kind of the way it was going to happen. People were going to have to smoke. And uh, God bless America. <laughs> I really enjoyed being in Washington D.C. two weeks ago, where it's legal, and smoking a joint on stage. Fucking loved it. <laughs> oh yeah. Um, let me throw two names out at you that are on your bio that I want to hear your your story oh, okay. about. The first one you already mentioned was Bill Graham. Bill, Bill, I, I didn't know him personally very well, but I had to work with him a lot because he was very hands-on on both coasts. He, uh, one of the things, one of my assignments, and I'd almost forgotten about this, was um, uh, we were assigned, me uh, and one of my fellow uh, upstate New Yorkers were assigned to decorating an apartment for him in Manhattan. And we're just a couple of decorating an apartment. I have no idea what the fuck to do, so we're doing we're doing it on the cheap, you know. And uh, so we're getting like cheap looking couch covers for old couches, and we're just, you know we're trying to make it look like what we think a house should look like, and you know, the hate. <laughs> uh, and, and Bill came and saw it and had everything thrown away, <laughs> and brought in a professional uh, designer. My only direct interaction with Bill was in, um, we're running a big show, like for example, the one big show we had there, just for excitement for some reason, was the Chambers Brothers. Oh, yeah. They were they were big hot on their, you know, their hit. And the people always kind of rushed the stage when great shows got hotter and hotter, you know, just like they do now, only we would have a lineup of, of our best beefy, uh, you know, guys out there blocking them and then i would be in charge of going out and rescuing a monitor or keeping a mic from hitting somebody and bill would send me out like a little minion uh and the only other time that we actually had an interaction is he caught me smoking a joint with jerry garcia right on the stage 
and that was one thing he did not like, and, and we were all on our best behavior when he was in the city. He did not like dope on the premises of any kind, except, of course, Jerry had a papal dispensation. <laughs> and because I was with the Pope, I got away with it. He did not fire me. <laughs> uh, but uh, he was a really fair, and we knew him to be somebody who really cared. We made good money. We got good pay. I think in those days I was making two fifty a week, and uh, that well, that would have been money. good money back then. Yeah, when the minimum wage was, was just, probably uh, two yeah, bucks. Yeah, I was just the guy in, in charge of the uh, entrance to the stage, the backstage from the audience. I mean, I wasn't even a, anything more than a you know sort of a glorified butt boy with a flashlight. You know. The other name I want to throw out is James Brown. James Brown was one of the coolest human beings I think I ever met. Uh, the first thing about James was that uh, he credited, right up until his death, the show we booked at the Lone Star as the beginning of the, the revitalization of his career. And we were very proud of that. We booked him in the middle of winter for a two-night stand, and it was very expensive. We had to we had to expand the stage. I think we all got all of an extra two feet on it or something, but we had to expand the stage. And we woke up the morning of the show, and it had been the worst snowstorm in 30 years. And there were four feet of snow on the city streets. Wow. And we thought, holy shit, we are going to eat it. And this show ain't going to happen. But they came anyway. <laughs> that place was rock and packed. It, 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 was a, it was like a miracle on ice. <laughs> what can I say? It was crazy. Uh, and then James... He was just, uh, and his um, his butt boy, you know, we call my uh, uh, position with Kinky executive butt boy because I'm not a manager and I'm not an agent. I do everything executive. And his, uh, James's executive butt boy at that time was Al Sharpton. The no kidding. Wow. And after each performance, and he did two a night, he would come downstairs into the steamy hot basement offices I mean, it was just, that's where we had the, all of the heat coming up into the house that was hot as shit, and it was wet as shit. And he, we had one office with air conditioning, and we offered to put him in the office with the air conditioning. And he said, no, I like it out here under my hair dryer. <laughs> <laughs> and he sat out there in the hallway with his hair dryer, blowing that hot heat on him, sweating profusely, until the next show. And then when he got up, Al got under it. Because <laughs> he had a pompadour as good as James at that time. I was just going to say, they probably had the same hair. They pretty much did. And, yeah. and Al, bless his heart, I, I don't dislike the guy at all, but boy, he was just a gopher. He was just amazing how James had him, you know, uh, as, as his uh, sole protector. It was uh, pretty cool. But James... Um, Good, good man, really good man. And thanks for asking about him. We got to mention your book because we have just about run out of time. And I know. Oh my God, I talk so much. I'm sorry about that. That's okay. Uh, Life is a butt dial. That's the name of it. Life is a butt dial. And, Great title. And and uh, yeah, tell us in about two minutes what the book's about. It's about all the stuff I've just been talking about, okay. and probably more. For some reason, I remember things like uh, some of my convict pals having names like Big Judy or Mikasa Sukasa, which was not an invitation, more of a command. And I just remember those things, and I started writing them down. And there's no, it's very Tarantino as far as timeline. Um, uh, so it's just the stories as I remember them. And uh, uh, it takes us from the, those glorious uh, hippie days in the hate the uh, film wars of which we spoke, the Austin music scene, the Armadillo World Headquarter, and all the great shows, including opening for Willie Nelson's first show there and Bruce Springsteen's first show there and selling out the houses because we were that those guys. And so it's a book about uh, a life of a 72-year-old who reads at the level of a 75-year-old hippie boy who, um, unfortunately for his friends, remembers everything. <laughs> That probably and is the unfortunate. Sub, yeah. The subtitle, of course, is Tales from a Life Among the Tragically Hip. Uh, I must say two more things. I've already been called the, the uh, Zelig of the Counterculture and the Beatnik Forest Gump. So, 
Oh, I like that one. Beatnik for I'm good with those. Yeah. Uh, give I, us don't know, I don't know if, I, if I'm that homely, but I'll go with those. <laughs> <laughs> give us your website so people can come check you out. Uh, the best place to find me is uh, I have my own Facebook page, uh, and uh, the greasywheels.com. That's G-R-E-E-Z-Y wheels.com, and that runs schedules and photos, and there's a store there, and um, it's all about me. Okay. <laughs> Well, you are Cleve Hattersley. Your book is called Life is a Butt Dial. Is it available now? It's available uh, pretty much uh, on many sites, uh, including Amazon, of course. Uh, And uh, we'll be touring for the next couple of months, my wife and I, with our little uh, show and signing things. So people should keep a watch out for us, please. Okay. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. This was a lot of fun. Douglas, it's been my sincere pleasure to talk about myself endlessly. Thank you. (laughs) All right. Well, take care. Best of luck with the book and your tour and everything you're doing. Thanks so much, Douglas. Uh, Good day to you, sir. You're listening to Mr. Smooth and Savvy right here on The Douglas Coleman Show. We'll be right back after these commercial messages. Since the dawn of man, storytelling has held the power to rewrite history and shape our future. That power has too often been used to manipulate us and prey on our sons and daughters with impunity. Teenagers, lured by the siren's call of Hollywood dreams, are pitted against each other and told, if you won't do it, there's a thousand more arriving tomorrow who will. The time has come to end this race to the bottom. Secrecy and silence no longer need to be the price for success. Technology, laws, and culture have culminated in a moment of opportunity where disruption is not just possible, but inevitable. Gratwick was established to be a turnkey studio capable of supporting local artists without luring them away. To remain accountable at all times, it will be owned and operated by the audience and the artists. Own a piece of a new, transparent Hollywood where you hold influence over what gets funded, who gets cast, and what charities we support. Visit Gratwick Productions on StartEngine.com today and take ownership over who has the power to entertain you. Hi there, this is Stuart Epps, record producer. This is my story about Elton John, uh, working with him in those early years, going back to 1967 at Dick James, uh, all the amazing tours, those first recordings, uh, going through the Rocket Records, and uh, it's an amazing story about his incredible rise to stardom and my part in that. So uh, look forward to taking you on that journey. So here we go. Yeah, and to order this great audio CD, please just email me at stuartepps at talk21.com. That's Stuart, S-T-U-A-R-T, Epps, E-P-P-S, at talk, T-A-L-K, 21 in figures, dot com. Stuart Epps at talk21.com. Email me and I'll give you all the details for buying this brilliant audio disc. Thank you. Bye. DJC Music and DJC Productions are pleased to announce a brand new website. We have started a listing website for radio show hosts as well as potential show guests. This is a meeting site where hosts and guests can come together. Show hosts can list their show and types of guests they're interested in booking. Potential guests can list their talents, bio, accomplishments or anything they feel makes them an interesting radio show guest. There are no recurrent payments, only a one-time $5 listing fee. Your listing will stay up until you decide to cancel. Previous guests of The Douglas Coleman Show are welcome to submit their guest listing free of charge. Go to radiohostsandguests.com. That's radiohostsandguests.com. Tired of living in a culture of lies, fake news, and alternative facts? The Pro-Truth Pledge reverses the tide of lies by calling on politicians, and everyone else, to commit to truth-oriented behaviors. The Pledge asks signees to commit to 12 behaviors that research in behavioral science shows lead to truthfulness, such as clarifying one's opinions and the facts, citing one's sources, and celebrating people who update their beliefs toward the truth. Private citizens who sign the pledge get the benefit of contributing to a more truth-oriented society. Public figures get more substantive rewards for signing the pledge, 
in the form of positive media and public recognition. The pledge crowdsources the truth by asking volunteers to evaluate the statements of public figures who sign the pledge. Take the pledge, demand that your elected representatives do so, and encourage your friends to take it at protruthpledge.org. Are you an independent musician? How would you like to have your songs played on hundreds of radio stations just like the one you're listening to right now? Join MusicSubmit.com and we'll promote your music to radio stations and blogs in your genre. It's free to set up your account and we guarantee your music will be considered for airplay by radio stations worldwide. Why not sign up today? It's free. MusicSubmit.com. Radio promotion for indie musicians. Hi, this is John Morgan, Production Supervisor for DJC Productions. You're listening to The Douglas Coleman Show. I'm Jeffrey Bryan, the keyboardist for Survivor, and very happy to be on the world-famous Douglas Coleman Show. Listen to uh, Count Me In, which is a, a tune I wrote. Sitting on my hands I wonder how the rest of the world can It seems like I'm the only one that's trying Maybe I just don't understand All my plans just sink in the sand Am I always gonna be marking time? Okay, please welcome to the Douglas Coleman Show, Jeffrey Bryan. Hey, Jeffrey, how are you? I'm great. Thanks for having me, Douglas. Well, thank you for coming on the show. I appreciate it. You've got a lot of stuff on your bio here. I did want to hit on a <laughs> couple of the points. Why don't you just tell us your backstory and then stop at uh, Karate Kid? Okay. Well, Karate Kid's early in that, uh, early on my timeline. But um, well, I'm a, I'm a, I, I originally started as a singer. That's, that's what I wanted to do when I was very young uh i was singing you know at, a, at probably about 10 11 years old and uh that that's really what i i cared about uh as far as being a musician it really wasn't in my as far as being a keyboard player that is I, that wasn't part of my plan early on and so i was i was uh i was living in you know i live in the valley san fernando valley back in the 80s and um i was uh performing at these uh, local, I guess you can call them open mic nights. You know, uh, there was a, a restaurant called The Hungry Tiger, I remember, and um, The Laugh Stop, and some of these other places that had existed back then. And um, I started to, you know, just develop myself as a singer. That's what I cared about. And as I was doing that, I uh, stumbled into a, a show that I was working on that I was asked to be a part of, I should say, when I was really young. I guess I was about 13 or 14 years old. And it was uh, called Too Young for Primetime Players, which was uh, a show for kids. It was a matinee at the Roxy. And I got to perform every weekend. Uh, and, and so I started writing my own songs, and I started you know, basically getting a lot of experience performing every weekend at a very young age. And from there, I... Uh, was seen 
I guess it, it, it at that time it was kind of a a new thing. You know, it wasn't it wasn't uh, something that was it was it was newsworthy, I guess. And so news crews would would come in and they would do little stories on us and, and whatnot. And uh, I ended up uh, being asked to perform on the Merv Griffin show. Wow! And from there, I got an agent because I looked young, and they said you should do acting. And I, you know, wasn't really interested in acting. I didn't really know what it was. I wasn't, you know, wasn't an actor. Um, but, I, you know, I, it, it was, you know, when opportunities come, you, you, I was kind of like pushed, to, you should do this. So I said, okay. I uh, didn't really know much about acting. It wasn't really something I had studied or paid attention to. But I was getting these little jobs. And one of them led me to The Karate Kid, which is... Uh, kind of an interesting story in itself but um yeah it was sort of this this uh th- this musician singing kid that uh kind of stumbled into acting by accident well it is kind of ironic that you were i assume you were an extra in karate kid is that correct <clears throat> not no i was a featured actor oh you what were was interesting about that okay. yeah i worked on that film for six months but i don't have a lot of footage in it and there's been a few other there's a few other guys that were also cast that were my, the way, the way it was cast was originally, the script was a lot longer and, um, a lot of the, uh, parts had been, every time I'd show up in my dressing trailer, they, they would have lines cut out. They just had too much story, I guess. They had two groups. They had, you know, the guys that were in the Cobra Kai and then they had, you know, his friends that he knew from, you know, around his apartment, Reseda. And there was there was there were other scenes and other parts of that um, you know, relationships that he had that they didn't really develop. And uh so it was kind of disappointing in in the sense that I, I was working but I wasn't actively being uh used. But um no, I was not actually an I mean I guess you could say it looks like I'm an extra, but I wasn't an extra. I was actually a feature actor. So you got credit in the movie? Oh yeah. Yeah, in fact, I, I I think if you watch the credits of the original movie, I'm 17th. 17th? Uh, oh, okay, that's not bad. As the credits are going by, you'll <laughs> see my name. Um, you know, another uh, person, uh, Frankie Avalon Jr., was also, uh, I, we call, we, the way we considered it is he was part of my group, which was the non, originally everybody was learning karate, and then they stopped that. They were like, well, that doesn't seem very realistic so they had a group of guys that were just kids from his school that were not part of cobra kai that were just regular guys that he met and that was that was uh you know me among a few other people a few other the actors and so there were a group of us that always hung out on set that you know we would sit and talk and hang out and (laughs) didn't have a lot of lines it was kind of odd. I mean, to be honest, at that point in my so-called acting career, that had been my that was my second feature film. So I had already done uh, a movie earlier that year called Hot Moves, which actually was a starring role, and uh, it's kind of a cult movie classic. It's kind of a, it was during the time when Porky's and Fast Times was real popular. I don't so remember a lot of those Hot Moves. Go ahead. Yeah, you, know, you you can find it. It's out there. But I think the whole movie's on YouTube. Oh, all right, I'll have to check that out. Is it like one of those teen kind of sex, drugs, and rock and roll movies? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Mostly, mostly sex and rock and roll. It was. It's <laughs> it's it, 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 it's it's just sort of a real. Uh, like I said, like pork. Remember Porky's? Yeah, sure. Oh yeah. yeah. Yeah, same kind of thing. They were real popular back then. Oh, uh, d- definitely. Know, and and, yeah. and there were tons of those movies being made. And uh, I guess partly because I looked, uh, you know, I could play, I was 18 by then, 17 or 18, and I could still play 15, you know, 14 years old. Um, So, you know, that was why, uh, you know, in Hollywood, it's, it's kind of how you look for the part. You know, obviously you need to be able to act and you need to have some talent, but generally, initially, being, looking young is, is, from an agency's point of view, that that's, looks like money to them because you're, you'll be able to work longer. So I looked really young. I still do, I think. And um, 
So I played really young. I got I got those kind of roles. Well, and you don't need a chaperone. If you're 18 and look 15 and they need 15 exactly. year olds for them. Exactly. It's much you know. cheaper for, for, yeah. Uh, for them. Yeah. Um, the one thing I was going to mention about Karate Kid, Survivor, sure. who you are <laughs> the current keyboardist yeah. for, right? That's correct, yeah. I've been now working they, with Survivor for about uh, three years now. They yeah. did some of the music for Karate Kid, is that right? Yeah, that's, uh, you know, it's funny. When I was younger, you know, I, of course I... We all we all watched Rocky and the whole series and and uh, the Eye of the Tiger for Rocky three was was a huge you know it was popular then like it is now it's, it's amazing how popular it is now considering it's been so many so many years but I didn't realize at that time uh, you know it took many many years for me uh, performing and and doing the rest of my career and things that I've been doing throughout the years to look back and realize there were so many connections I had with that band. Um, kind of interesting uh to answer your question uh survivor had the theme song for rocky three and rocky four and then um they also uh recorded moment of truth for karate kid which was also the theme song but it was used as a promotional theme song so it was used in all the promo videos and, oh, you know, the okay. TV trailers all right I was just going to say, because now I, rem you know, it's been a long time since I've seen Karate Kid, but I remember now the theme song was the Chicago song, right? Or Peter Cetera? Well, it was in the movie, but um, Moment of Truth was the one associated with the advertising of the movie. Oh, okay. All right. Remember the Moment of Truth? Da -da -da -da. Remember that? Okay, you know, the the one that's stuck in my head now is the I am the man that will fight for your honor. Now, yeah, there's so many great songs on that soundtrack. <laughs> okay. But, I mean, it's just amazing that they that, that they uh, they had a song on that soundtrack. You know, it's funny, too, because that's not a song that they had written, which was, there's a whole other story about that. But Let's talk a little bit about the Merv Griffin show. Uh, tell me yeah. a little bit about that experience. That was very interesting. That was the first time I had ever done any kind of live television. So obviously it was a really, really interesting and new experience. I did, by that time, I had been performing. I was about 15, I think, when I did the Merv Griffin show. And I had already been performing for years in front of audiences. It was not unusual for me to get up and sing songs at that age. My thing about the, the reason why that whole thing happened was because of these shows I, I mentioned earlier that we were doing, um, the Roxy and another right. one at the last stop on these Sunday matinees. And so the, 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 uh, the idea of having some of the kids from those shows to come on and, and do part of what they do on a Sunday is the, the reason why I was there. And they selected just a handful of, uh, you know, just a small amount of us. And I was one of them that they thought I would uh, have me on. So um, I wanted to sing my own song, my own material. And it was interesting because they wouldn't let me. I had to pick from a song. I had to pick from a list of songs that they had publishing rights to, to be, you know, licensing rights to be able to do. So it was it was strange. I, I was like, I can't do my own material. What? So uh, I had I ended up singing uh, the best of times by Styx which was one of my favorite bands at that time. And uh, it was fun. Uh, it, uh, Jerry Lewis was on the show that, that night. Oh, yeah. And uh, it was, uh, you know, it, it's kind of interesting. I, I didn't get to sit and talk to, uh, to Merv, but um, I think I was the last performer I came on at the end of the show, and I did a full song with the band, and thrilling. It was really cool. So you didn't, okay, you didn't sit there and talk to Merv. Did you get to meet him at least? Yeah, of course. I, I did meet him, yes. But not, not on TV. But not on TV. Okay. Um, the uh, the not-too-young-for-prime-time players, that was kind of like a variety show, a live stage variety show? Yeah, exactly. And okay. they, they, kind of, they kind of stole the name from the Saturday Night From Night Saturday Live, Night Live, yeah. Uh, <laughs> kind of vibe. But yeah, it was a variety show. It wasn't just singers. It was dancers and and in the plays and things like that. But it was generally for for uh, birthday parties for kids. And I guess at the time, you know, these, these venues were looking to make a little extra money on the weekends. And 
they open their doors to these birthday parties and and i i don't remember i was pretty young so i can't remember exactly who produced this show um but there were a couple of people that had a deal with those venues and they would come in and and uh on a sunday do a matinee show a couple hour long matinee show and they'd have these birthday parties and these kids would come in and it was literally a show for kids you know it, it was yeah. kind of unique but what was great about it for me personally is that it gave me an opportunity to, it, you know at that time i was studying and i was you know learning how to read and write music i was learning you know how to write songs i was you know just starting out and it gave me an opportunity to be in a semi somewhat professional situation and and try out all these things live in front of people week after week after week and uh, you, there's no better education than that i mean it's just i always think about how fortunate i was to to be a part of you know something that was allowed me to to develop in front of people you know oh certainly uh let's move it up to the next step here at least from what i'm taking off your bio you got signed to a and m records that's pretty impressive yeah well actually to be uh, a little more clear it was almo irving which is a publishing company and at the time a and m records had uh their publishing wing was called almo irving which was later sold uh, uh i think when polygram bought a and m and then they sold that part over to Rondor, which is, it's now been Rondor Music ever since. Um, so it was a publishing deal. It wasn't a record deal. It wasn't a record deal. Okay. And it, All right. Yeah. And it, and it was staff writer. So, uh, you know, I was, uh, I was performing around town in one of my various bands. And um, actually, there's a funny story behind that. It was my birthday. And a, a couple of friends of mine and got together and they took me out to dinner. And we went to Michelli's. And I don't know if you know, I don't know if your audience, probably not all of them would know, but Michelli's is sort of a, a famous little Italian restaurant on Ventura Boulevard where a lot of actors go um, and a lot of musicians and at that time in the 80s. And it was, it was known for, uh, you know, your waiter would bring you a pizza and then they'd sing to you. So oh, okay. they would get up and do an <laughs> opera or they'd get up and do something from, you know, some musical or, some rock song or whatever so it's kind of kind of a very uh eclectic you know artsy place and i had gone there and with my friends and we were eating and i was kind of hey jeff get up and do do one of your songs so i got up and i sat down at the piano and i played one of uh one of my songs that i had written and that was it and I, I everyone liked it and it was fun and whatever i get back to my table and some gentleman walked up to my table and put a card down he was from a&m Records. And that's how uh, I met, you know, that's how they found me for, uh, for songwriting, for publishing. I wanted to ask you about being a uh, staff writer. I, I get this picture of like the Tin Pan Alley guys who just sit there all day and write songs. Is that <laughs> what you did? Well, you know, it's not really too far off. Uh, the way, the, I'm sure the deals are different now, but the way it was constructed then was they gave you a... Uh, a stipend or a, a certain amount of money every month to record. And you had a responsibility to give them X number of songs a month. So, you know, maybe your contract was for a year and you had to deliver, you know, uh, 20, 24 songs in that year. So you had two a month that you had to give them. And they gave you a, they gave you a record back then. Not everybody had recording studios in their houses, right. you know, um, you didn't have a computer, so you had to go and record your stuff. So they gave you a recording budget, which I believe was something like, I don't know, four or $500 a month. Plus, they gave you a salary, which was an advance on whatever they would eventually place for you if, if you got anything placed with an artist or whoever. So, um, yeah, that was my job for a while, which didn't last as long as I wanted it to. How long did it last? It lasted for less than a year because Polygram came in and decided to purchase A&M. And I learned the hard knocks of the business that, you know, if you don't have a hit song and you're not making money for the record company, they decided to clean house and no one knew who I was at the time. I think I was 20. And um, so I ended up getting, uh, getting, you know, let go. It was just unfortunate. Did they give you any kind of a guideline as to what type of songs they wanted you to write or they just said you know they let you lose 
Well, yeah. First of all, they when they met me, they knew I was a pop writer. They knew I wrote rock songs and pop, and so that wasn't you know a surprise. Uh, but you know, there, it took a few months for them to uh, for it to develop into the relationship that we eventually when I before I signed with them, and um, so they had come see my band, so they knew what kind of material I was writing. So it was expected I would continue to write like that. The idea was that they would start off with a production, I'm sorry, with a, with a publishing deal, which was what I was doing with them. And then if that developed, they would develop me into an artist deal. Which, So I was really writing songs for myself in hopes that they would also be used for other artists. But um, primarily, from my point of view, it was just songs I would be writing anyway. Oh, all right. So if any songs that they didn't want, you could keep the rights to it? Yeah, but the way the publishing deal works, especially when you're a new artist, is they usually take your publishing. So you split the song. As you know, there's writers and publishers. Right. And um, so I had a, I had a publishing deal where they owned the publishing on everything that I wrote. If, if initially, now I think I, I'm just trying to remember. It's been a long time, but I believe that had that developed into a full blown record deal, I would have renegotiated the publishing to either a co-pub or I would have bought back most of my publishing. But um, early on, you really don't have much to negotiate with, and that's pretty normal in the business. I, I think that holds true for any artist, be it a writer or be it a performer. You know, there's a point where you're starting out where you just can't afford artistic integrity, and you'll kind of just yeah. take whatever they give you, and then as you go, hopefully, up the ladder... Uh, then you can start to renegotiate. But, you know, it didn't always work out that way for some people. I'm just thinking of That's like true. Jim Croce, who had probably the oh, worst yeah. record deal in the world, you know? And, yeah. And then he died right at the top of his <laughs> top of his career. So, I mean, that's like yeah. the ultimate tragic yeah, story. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's, um, it's kind of a, it's an unfortunate calculated risk that you have to make as a new artist that, um, you have to, uh, you don't have much, like you said, much to, you don't have anything to negotiate with really in, ter in, in, in terms of, uh, credibility or, or, or history. And so you, you only have your art. And if someone values that and thinks it's worth something, it's the only thing you got to, to, to bargain with. And generally they're going to want to be partners. Right. And, exactly. you know, and so you really, I mean, I get it. Um, I understand why that was the norm. I, I think things are a little different in some cases nowadays with your, you know, you can self-publish and put your stuff on YouTube and hopefully develop a, a following and, you know, have a little bit more um, leverage. Uh, but in those days, you know, there was no internet, believe it or not. Um, so, I mean, you pretty much were at their mercy. I mean, it's like someone came to you and said, look, I'm going to, I'm going to give you a, uh, you know, fifteen thousand dollars to write me twenty songs. What are you going to do? You're starving. You, you, you to take it, okay? Well, of course. I mean, yeah. it, best case scenario, they 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 place a song of yours, it becomes a hit. Okay, so you make fifty percent of it, but um, it gets you off the off the ground. So I, I don't I don't really um, I completely understand why you know why artists take deals like that. They they don't really have a choice, but. You know, it's it's too bad that there isn't um, something in the middle. You know that uh, that yeah. You know, the thing is, though, when you're talking to say an uh, um, like an A and M Records or or you know Universal Records or somebody, those those record companies have so much pull and they have a lot of credibility that you you're, you tend to be like, okay, well that's kind of worth it. But when you get one of these small unknown distribution label companies or something, you really don't want to give stuff away because you don't, they may not be any more powerful than you. Well, and especially with the internet. I mean, that's leveled the playing field a lot for artists, yeah. music artists particularly. It certainly has. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, we're kind of running out of time here, but I want to hit on Survivor real quick. Uh, how, did sure. you get, how did you get hooked up with them? Uh, actually, how long have you been with them? I've been with Survivor for, I'll be going on... Uh, Three and a half years now. Okay. And um, Survivor uh, really kind of came out of the blue. I um, 
I, I, first of all, I, I play all over LA and I'm, I'm kind of a local musician. I, I've got so many projects that I'm performing in right now, even. And, um, I, I can't really tell you how they came to me. <laughs> I just know I got, a, I got an email from the manager and, and she asked me if I'd be in, in the email, would you be interested in playing keyboards for, for Survivor? And I looked at the email and thought, okay, who's, who's joking with me here? What, what is this? Uh, you know, um, and then I looked at the, uh, the email address and it, it came from Irving Azoff's office. So I thought, okay, this is real. So I, uh, I, I said yes. And then it went from there. But as far as them, uh, actually finding out about me, it could have been a myriad of different ways. And to be honest, I, I never really asked them. <laughs> that doesn't help much, does it? No, but I mean, you know, maybe so what, right? They got you and you working with them, I guess it doesn't make any difference. Morbid curiosity. Yeah, I, mean, you know, I was so I was so uh, thrilled to be to be asked and, and you know, of course I had to audition and, and they flew me to Chicago and I met with them and we played and it was it was pretty pretty good from the beginning. I mean it was it was uh you know, it just felt right right away. So it wasn't really a very difficult process. So I guess, you know, they probably did their homework on me and but uh yeah, I was real happy. What are you doing right now? Are you promoting anything? Any shows, upcoming shows or song or anything? Well, so Survivor's obviously going to be going out this year again. Uh, we're starting up in, in um, March. Uh, usually, uh, I don't know if everyone knows, but Chicago, it, it, but Survivor's based, based out of Chicago. So they're, they tend to hibernate in the winter. <laughs> it's cold know. and they don't travel as much as they used to in the winter. But um, So we'll start up again in March and but I, I do have uh, projects that I do on my own here. Um, one is called the KTEL All Stars, and um, it's the KTELAllStars.com. If anyone wants to check it out, um, basically it's a tribute to the '70s, and these are fantastic musicians, some of the best guys in LA, and we we uh, we reproduce songs that are one-hit wonders, uh, classic top ten songs, AM radio from 1970 to 1979, and we play them as close to the record as absolutely possible. Uh, so, you know, um, so it's a great band. I love playing with these guys. And we're, we're playing all over L.A. and beyond, Vegas, everywhere. Great, great. Uh, give us your website so people can come check you out. Sure. My website is jeffreybryanmusic.com. So it's J-E-F-F-R-E-Y-B-R-Y-A-N music.com. Um, or equally, you could go to Jeff Keyboards with an S, jeffkeyboards.com. That'll take you there, too. Okay, super. Okay, Jeff, well, we got to wrap this up. Thanks so much for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. It was really interesting talking to you. And I am going yeah, to check out, check out the Karate Kid and Hot Moves, <laughs> see if I can <laughs> find you. Best of luck with everything you're doing. I hope it all oh, goes well. Oh, thank you so much, Douglas. I, I appreciate you having me on and getting the opportunity to speak with you. Thank you. Well, that's about all the time we've got for the show today. I want to thank my special guests, Cleve Hattersley and Jeffrey Bryan. Thank you, guys. This is Douglas Coleman saying I'll see you later. To the mountain.